Brighton. I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer for 12 years. I've been a Drupal developer since the full past six days. Um, and this is a talk that I've been giving um, recently because I've been speaking out a lot about the lack of diversity in tech. Um, and I really believe that this is something we can solve, but I think a lot of people don't have necessarily the tools or understand how bad the problem is. Um, so we're just going to take some time to kind of cover that. Just as a heads up, if you have to ask a question, um, I'm hard of hearing, so just make sure that you can project. So. Cool. So, uh, like I said, I've been going um, all over the world um, talking about this. And um, because I'm doing this basically full time, I um, am not taking any consulting clients. Um, so I'm very lucky that a lot of companies have gone out of their way to kind of um, help me do travel and that kind of thing. So I think you should have two responses. So like I said, my name is Ash Dryden. I'm Ash Dryden pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, afterwards, if you have any other questions or if you think of other things that you didn't get a chance to talk to me about, feel free to um, hit me up on Twitter, which is the best way to contact me. Otherwise, there's a ton of resources that I have available on my site. So what is diversity? Um, a lot of times when we talk about diversity in tech, a lot of people bring up like the where are the women issue. Um, you know, where, where are the women in tech? Um, but I want to remind everybody that diversity is a lot more than gender, it's a lot more than male and female. Um, and I think it's important that we talk about these things um, because there's a lot of different groups that we're completely missing out here. So diversity is um, people who have various um, backgrounds, experiences, and lifestyles. It all kind of contributes to um, a difference in the way that they go through life, the way that they go through life. Diversity doesn't always have to be visible. So there are a lot of things about us that are different. Um, there are things like, um, actually I just realized my notes are down. Um, there are things like um, our um, brains can be different. Our socioeconomic status can be different. Um, we can, thank you. Um, um, our education is different. Um, so there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily visible. Um, some other things that kind of contribute to diversity are things like age, young and old. If you go to any uh, camper conference, look around and see what groups are missing. Um, things like physical and mental health, things you can't necessarily see. Economic class I mentioned before, and education. Um, so just to um, kind of cover some basic vocabulary so we're all on the same page, um, a lot of what I talk about deals with the idea of intersectionality. So it's Kind of, if we go back to those little bubbles we were talking about before, intersectionality is all of these things overlapping. It's basically saying that the way um, one person in one group goes through life is different than the way that somebody else in maybe a couple different groups goes through life. So if we take a look at these bubbles that overlap, it's the way that somebody with all of these differing traits goes through life. So the way that I'm able to go through life as a white woman is very different than a woman of color. So let's do some examples here. In the United States, for instance, women earn on average about 80.9% of what men do. And this is for controlling for all other factors, including education, time, in and away from the industry. Latina women only make 59.3% of what white men do. So imagine going home today and 40% of your income is gone. That is the reality of a lot of people's lives, purely because they're slightly different, purely because of the way society views them and um, the kinds of kinds of things that we bestow on people that are different than us. So another example of the unemployment rate in the United States, depending on who you trust, is about 7.5%. Uh, but for the blind community, it's 10 times that. It's a really big difference there, right? So the next key uh, term that we'll talk about is privilege. Privilege is basically an unearned advantage you get for being born the person you are or having the advantages that you had growing up. Um, so for instance, I'm a very privileged person um, because I'm white. That basically gives me the most amount of privilege that one can get um, as far as race in society. Um, I don't worry that I'm um, walking behind somebody on the street, somebody is going across the street. Um, I get paid much better than other groups of people. Um, the rates of education for the neighborhoods I'm likely to live in are much better. Um, much, I'm far less likely to be targeted um, for crimes than I can think. So some of the things that we get for having these privileges, and all of us have them. We, we have different privileges, so it's not really like I have more privileges than you, you have less than me. Um, but some of the things that you get for having privilege are things like a better education, um, access to technology at an earlier age, which we'll talk, to, talk about a little bit later, um, higher pay, which I spoke about before, um, assumed competency. So it's not having to prove how smart you are because you might fall into a group that meets some stereotype that assumes you're not as good or um, capable as someone else. And also you're seen as a skill set instead of traits. So this is the difference between being a geek and between being a geek girl or a girl geek. 
right? For the first one, you don't have to qualify it. It you automatically assume that it's a white guy. So the next term is stereotype threat. I think most people understand what the word stereotype is, and they've seen that in their everyday lives. The stereotype threat is basically having a stereotype about your group and being afraid to confirm that. So I think that a lot of people have seen XKCD before. Um, this is an excellent example of this. On one side, you have a man talking to another man saying, wow, you suck at math. On the other, you have a man talking to a woman saying, wow, girls suck at math. So there's a stereotype that, that girls and women aren't good at math. So now that you know you might not have proficiency in math, you're proving to me that this is something true about your group. So you're basically being forced to perform. And uh, so the interesting thing about this is that studies have actually shown that prompting someone based on a trait that they might possess actually makes them do worse at things. So there was a study that was done where they basically did a standardized test. And they prompted groups of people and they said, okay, you're a woman. Did you know that women don't do as well on this test as men? And the women did worse. When they prompted the group and said, oh, you're a woman. Did you know that women actually do just as well at this as men? They actually did better than the men. So this fear that we're going to confirm a stereotype, no matter what our group is, that we're going to confirm the stereotype about us actually makes us do worse. So we also have something called imposter syndrome. How many people have, know of or have imposter syndrome? I do, awesome. Okay, so imposter syndrome is basically this phenomenon that, that everybody suffers from, any, any group of people can suffer from, where you're basically unable to internalize any accomplishments that you might have achieved. So, <laughs> exactly. So these are the people that say, I'm a really bad programmer, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm super afraid that people are gonna find out that uh, I don't know as much as they think that I know. And this is something that has like plagued me for years, and it sucks. Like every single time I get up to do a talk, and I speak frequently, this is always my biggest concern. Somebody is going to know something more than I do, and it's gonna be something I haven't thought of, and then they're just going to know that I'm a total fraud, right? And the interesting thing about this is, it do while it does affect um, anybody, it's especially prevalent amongst people who have negative stereotypes associated with them. So if you're already being told that, you know, I've never seen any black programmers, um, are you sure like this is the room that you're supposed to be in? Um, they're less likely to be able to identify with like being a programmer, being a good programmer, being able to excel at what they do. Um, in addition, they're less likely to apply for certain jobs, especially in groups where competency has to be proven. I can't tell you how many conferences I've gone to where like, I mentioned that I'm a huge Star Trek nerd and then people want to quiz me on Star Trek like to prove that like, I might not know, you know anything about Star Trek. I'm just trying to fit in with people. Uh, less likely to submit a talk to a conference, less likely to even attend a conference. So imagine how much you know, going to camps and conferences does for you as a professional, whether it's meeting people, networking, learning, um, being able to get a better job. Now. Now the, the idea of feeling like you can't actually go to those kinds of events because people are going to think you don't belong there, you don't fit in, you're different than us. So the last term is marginalized. Now if you think back to uh, like high school where we had the college rolled paper, you know the blue lines and then the pink lines vertically, the margin is everything that was outside of that pink line, right? A little tiny bit of space, and that's where you drew all of like, your, your dragon doodles, and you're like, wow, I really hate algebra, and you know, all of those little things that really didn't mean much. Now, marginal marginalization is not too different than that. It's basically pushing people that aren't uh, the default or what we consider normal, basically out to those margins, and there's less space for them to have their needs or their wants met. And unfortunately, society teaches us to do this to um, everyone within marginalized groups. Um, and you might be thinking, well, I'm a programmer, I'm, I'm logical and I'm rational. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't look at people and think about their gender or their race. I don't judge them or treat them differently based on these facts. Um, but the people that we herald as the um, most logical and the most rational amongst us, scientists, STEM professors, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, in case you're not familiar, um, they did, did they do this to each other too? Yeah which is kind of amazing. Like there was this um, study that was done at Yale where they took a bunch of um, STEM professors and they said, okay, we have a couple candidates that we would like you to kind of decide who you would like to work with. So they give them two resumes and they don't tell them that the only difference is the first name. One is named John and one is named Jennifer. Exactly the same resume. And they said, okay, on a scale of one to seven, who would you rather work with, John or Jennifer? What would you pay each one of them? What uh, words would you use to describe them based on what you've seen 
from the resume. So remembering that the resumes are exactly the same with the exception of the first name, on a scale of one to seven, they gave John a four and Jennifer a 3.3. Okay, same resume. Uh, they asked how much you would pay each person and they decided to pay Jennifer 87% of what they paid John. They asked what traits would you use to describe each one of these people? John is driven. He is a team leader. He, um, he works really well with other people. Jennifer is a bitch. She's out for herself. She's not fun to work with. Exact same resume, and this is what they got from these resumes. The interesting thing is these groups of STEM professors were mixed gender. Women did this to other women. So it, this is not just a problem within one community. Society teaches us to do this to everybody, unfortunately. And it's a really hard thing to combat because we don't know what's there. It's a bias and we don't know what we have. So, Kind of stepping back a little bit, um, we're talking about diversity in tech. So how diverse is the tech industry? Um, well, if we take a look at this graph, um, the blue bars represent the tech industry and the black are the US population. You can see that some groups are a little bit more top heavy than other ones, right? And we're particularly looking at these top three ones here. There's something a little bit off about them. Women make up about half in tech that they do in the US population. Um, for um, black and African American people, it's about half as well. And the most troubling is Hispanics make up about a third in tech that they do in the US population. So we talk a lot about women in tech, but there's a huge group here that we're missing that are far more marginalized than women. So let's dig into this a little bit deeper. And I apologize, a lot of these um, examples uh, focus specifically on gender, um, but that's where a lot of the research dollars are, so that's where a lot of these studies come. So women make up about 24% of the industry. This is a number that's actually dropping. Um, but we're only 3% of all open source contributors. So think about every job that requires that even to apply, you need to have made an open source contribution. 3%. And you know, this isn't just us. It's not like you know the United States is especially bad at this because we have, you know, we're a young country and you know, we have a lot of problems with, with race and gender. This is a global problem. So if we take a look, um, at the computer science graduates, uh, the female com computer science graduates from around the world, we see things like this. India's got about 8% women that are gradu graduating with computer science degrees. The US is 17, this number is falling about 3% every four years. The UK, 18.2, France is 20, Brazil is 20, you can see they're kind of trending in the same direction. Um, South Africa is 25%. So we're kind of on par with some other people. We're doing better than, than some countries and, and worse than others. Um, and I get to this point a lot of times in talking with people and they'll say things like, well, I guess women just aren't interested in programming. And you know, it, you know, you might think that's the case, especially if you don't know any female programmers, right? Um, but it's interesting to know that the first compiler and the first programming language were written by women. The word bug was coined by a woman. The word computer comes from a job that a woman used to do to compute numbers, to compute trajectories for missiles, actually. So if women aren't interested in programming, then why did we invent it, right? Or people will say, well, maybe women just aren't biologically predisposed to programming, which is like my favorite reaction, right? Because I don't know any programmer that's ever, you know, because of their amazing uh, algorithmic skills, been able to outrun a cheetah and not die. You know, this is not something that we're like passing on to our progeny and saying, yes, I'm an excellent programmer, and I'm passing this on to you, and because of this, you will not die. Like, that's not the way that it works, right? But this is something that a lot of people believe. Do you raise your hand? <laughs> so so the, the thing to remember is there's no physical or biological difference between any race, any gender, that basically says some people are more likely or more apt to be programmers. That, that may not be true. Women may have some competitive advantages in terms of biological differences. Uh, OK, well, I'm, this is based on scientific research, so I'm just going with my research. Um, but in any case, um, so the, the cool thing is that this means that it's a purely social and cultural construct. This is something that we can overcome if we want to, and if we work hard enough at it. It's not something that we're stuck with forever. This problem isn't going to continue to get worse if uh, we don't let it. So one of the countries I didn't mention in the batch before is Bulgaria. Like, I found this statistic, and it shocked me. Like, as an American, with an American high school education, um, 
I can maybe locate Bulgaria on a map on a good day, right? I, I don't know much about the people of Bulgaria. Uh, I don't know much about this area of the world in general because it's not something that we've learned a lot about in you know, our kind of interesting high school educations. So what is Bulgaria doing that they're getting 73% of their CS grads are women? When the United States has 17 and that number is dropping. Bulgaria is an interesting case, as well as much of Eastern Europe, in that they don't believe that anything in STEM is gendered. They know that it's required of their country that they do well in STEM to push everybody, regardless of gender, uh, forward into this industry, because they know it's important for the innovations that they can make, for um, their standing in the world, and for what they can do as a people. So, we can do just as well as Bulgaria. We can do this. I mean, especially if, you, if we consider the fact like Bulgaria has had a lot of issues with, with poverty. You know, we talked a lot about, you know, maybe people aren't getting CS degrees because of the cost of CS degrees. And, and Bulgaria has rampant poverty, far worse than the United States. So we can fix this. So why does diversity matter? Why does diversity matter? Um, and you might be thinking, why does it matter to me? Like, I'm a white dude, I'm a white straight dude, I live in the United States, I speak English as a first language. Um, you know, this doesn't really affect me. Like, why, why should I care? And it's interesting because a lot of research shows that the more diverse a team is, and this is racial and gender diversity, um, as that increases, so does sales revenue, number of customers, uh, market share, profits relative to competitors. Like, how many people would like a raise today? Like, this is a really good way, right? If your company makes more money, then you make more money. We also solve complex problems better and faster. And that's kind of useful in programming, right? It's kind of something good, you know, think about how long you bang your head against a problem. This is something that we think <coughs> about all the time. We're more creative and stimulated when, we're, um, when we have persistent exposure to minority perspectives and viewpoints. We have people telling us to think outside the box, to think differently about things to not approach the problem from the same way every time. To actually think about a problem we didn't even know was there before somebody brings it up. We also make better decisions and we generate more innovation. STEM fields are on the cutting edge of everything that we know globally. This is something that is pushing forward, especially technology, it's pushing forward everything that we're doing. It's pushing forward education, transportation, our cultures, um, the way that we are able to, uh, or the, the length of lives that we're able to lead. So this is something that's extremely important, and it's not something that we're focusing enough on. So if we know that the financial success and viability of not only ourselves, our companies, and our countries entirely depends on the kinds of people that we have working in our companies, why aren't we fo focusing more on this? So why do we have black diversity? And this is, this is the hard section. Uh, this is kind of extra credit. Now that you've gotten through kind of the really sad stuff, um, I'm going to take you through a little bit more sad stuff. So like bubble in, right? So the pipeline. These are the people that are coming into the industry. We hear a lot of people talk about this like, well, you know, there aren't enough, well, I'll use the women example again because that's when it gets brought up. There aren't enough women here, so we need to make sure that girls have access to computers when they're younger. We need to make sure that, um, <clears throat> that they're being told that, you know, they can get into and this is where we should spend all of our time. This is where all the problems are. So we have these cultural cues that basically tell us that boys are different from girls. And I think that, you know, just kind of looking around the room, you can tell, like, we have a lot of things that are different about us. And that's perfectly fine. But society kind of dictates some of those things. If you've ever walked down the toy aisle in the Toys R Us, between the boy aisle and the girl aisle, you'll tell a huge amount of difference, right? Number one, the girl aisle is completely pink sparkly, pastel, unicorns, and that's perfectly fine. There are a lot of girls that like those things. There are a lot of boys that like those things too, but we kind of even include it. <laughs> I knew we would like them. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of people that like those things that are kind of told um, by society, like those things aren't for you. So um, we don't realize that, you know, even if our parents are saying, hey, I don't want my kids to only be playing with, you know, um, Barbie, Barbie houses, and we're only playing with Legos, um, that that's something that they're stuck doing. But this is kind of something that's bigger than that. This is something that TV is telling kids. 
their friends at school are telling them. Um, every message that's coming out them is basically saying, this is for boys, this is for girls, and if you like something else other than that, there's something weird about you, something, something a little off, and you're not quite displaying um, this gender the way that we expect you to be displaying it. We also don't have any famous role models that represent us. So if you think about all of the famous programmers over the history of time, like how many people knew in here that a woman wrote the first programming language before I said that this morning? Okay, good, awesome. How many people know, knew that the first compiler was written by a woman? Okay, about the same people. So we, we have these ideas of who, or we, we worship these certain people in our society, you know? Um, we have people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and all of these people have a couple things in common, right? They're white, they're from the United States, they're men. We, it's one very specific group of people, and that seems to be the same group of people that's prevalent in our industry. So we need to have more people that are reaching these kind of um, role model roles that we're not seeing right now. Like I said before, um, access to technology is different for different groups of people. So if you look at the fact that boys get their first computer at the age of 11, which actually seems kind of late to me because I know so many programmers are like, I was programming when I was six and it was so awesome. I'm like, good for you. That's great. Like you've been, you've basically been programming um, 10, 15 years longer than a lot of people that I know. That's, that's a huge advantage. Girls get their first computer about the age of 14. Now, what is, what is the difference between age 11 and age 14? Like think about when you were going through puberty. Think about how awkward that period of your life was. Think about the kinds of things that you were doing. If you were, you know, stuck at home and you, you know, didn't have a lot of friends, I don't know, I don't even want to, you know, it's not even the antisocial thing, but it's, you know, it's being sucked into something and really enjoying something for, you know, a lot of period of time. During your, during your uh, prepubescent and pubescent years, it's extremely important the way your brain is rewiring things, the way that you're able to learn and able to take things in. It's very different. Additionally, there are lower computer ownership rates and broadband adoption amongst uh, black and Hispanic households. So a lot of us were probably very lucky that we had internet in our homes at a very young age, um, probably around the same time that we got our first computer. Um, but those same communities adopt smartphones at a much higher rate. So think about now the application that you've developed recently or the application that uh, your company has, any web app, like something like that. Um, what is the mobile experience like? Are you able to do as much on the, uh, the web app or the mobile app as you're able to do on the desktop version? How frustrating is it to try and get something done on your phone when you're just like, screw it, I'm just gonna wait until I get to my computer. Now, imagine that's the only view of the internet you've ever had. Try and sign up for electricity, try and sign up, try and sign up your kid for school. Um, try and find out where you're supposed to vote. All of these things, and all you have is a phone. It's an extremely different view of the internet than a lot of us have. We also have a very huge difference in the access of quality education. And a quality high school education is one of the greatest indicators of earning potential. Um, we have a lot of schools that are in really poor neighborhoods where the um, math and science programs are so much worse that uh, black and Hispanic students in particular are going to college with 25% uh, less knowledge than their white counterparts. So you are <coughs> a year behind by the time you get to college. So that's more money, that's more time, that's more time out of the workforce. All of these things contribute to, you know, who is likely to go into a computer field. Access to healthcare. Uh, people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, um, all have less access to quality health care, and they're also less likely to take the risk of leaving a place with quality health care. Because that could mean not being able to take your kids to the doctor. That could mean you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have medication that you need to take every single day to basically live a normal life. You have epilepsy, and not taking this medication could mean you having a seizure at work and dying. We'll see. Now, risking that lapse in health insurance to go to a better job, where you may be getting paid 20% more, where you may be in a better neighborhood, um, your family will be much better off. Is that, is that amount of reward worth possibly dying for? That's what a lot of people are looking at. Additionally, women are a lot more likely to be caregivers, and this is not only of children, but also adult dependents. Um, so ailing parents, uh, siblings, grandparents, that kind of thing. Um, 
And we need to be able to give them health care as well. We need to make sure that you know they're still being taken care of. So the second area, I mentioned pipeline before, this is the second area, attraction. So what attracts people to the field? What makes people think that this is something that they could do? Again, like I said before, the lack of role models. We don't have a lot of people that represent us. Um, we're also not likely to see people like us struggle um, and succeed in the things that we do, which is really important. A lot of marginalized people know that it's gonna be hard. They know that there are things like uh, less income, less access to opportunity that, that they have to overcome but they're not seeing people like them overcome those things either. We also struggle with something called the geek stereotype. Now think of what a geek is, right? Think of what movies and television have told you what a geek is. Think about any, any movie or TV show within the last 20 years that has depicted a geek. They're white, they're straight, almost all of them are male, right? They're from the United States. They tape on their glasses, they're antisocial or they're extremely awkward, right? So this is one specific stereotype. Now this is maybe the only geek you have ever seen. You know no other geeks. This is exactly what you see, right? Now that stereotype hinders us. And there's this interesting study that shows that um, when, it, when you have a class of indiv individuals in a college um, and you bring in somebody who meets that geek stereotype and you have them teach their class even just once, by the end of the sem semester, anybody who doesn't represent that geek stereotype, so they're not socially awkward, white, um, anything like that, they're far more likely to drop out because they're thinking to themselves, am I gonna fit in? Am I gonna have friends in this career that I'm hoping to go into? Am I gonna be miserable because nobody is like me? Yes. Isn't Felicia Day basically trying to fight this? She is, yes. But she's the exception, right? Like, can you name five? Right? The ones on her show. Not right. About it. But can you name five men that need that? It's a lot easier, right? So, like, so there are always going to be exceptions to this, but they're definitely not the norm. Um, and the interesting thing about this study is that they found that regardless of gender, regardless of the gender of the person who met that geek stereotype that taught them, they were still as likely to leave that class to quit computer science. So it doesn't matter. And now, if you meet this stereotype, that's perfectly fine. I definitely don't want to tell people to not be who they are. Um, but we need to think about the fact that this is a really complex problem. It's a lot more than like, maybe we should be giving little girls Legos, right? There are a lot of things that contribute to the lack of diversity in the industry. So um, about this point, I have people say, well, if they wanted to be here, they would be here. Uh, you know, if women, if women wanted to go to conferences, if people of color wanted to um, work at, at Facebook, they would. Why, you know, why don't they apply to the jobs that we have out there? And like I said, it's, it's complicated, right? There are a lot of different things that are basically telling people, like, maybe this isn't for you, or this opportunity doesn't quite work in a way that would fit your life or your family. So the third area, and the, the reason that I talk about this a lot, is attrition. And this is the scariest one for me. We talk a lot about pipeline in the industry, you know, what can we do, you know, to, to get more people into the industry, but there are actually more people leaving than there are coming. In particular, the attrition rate for women is startling. 56% of women leave tech within 10 years. Now, like I said at the beginning, I've been a programmer for 12 years, so I'm like every day defying this, but also like once every three or four months, I'm like, fuck it, I'm done with programming. I can't, like I can't do this anymore. Like I just can't deal with, you know, one more person, you know, challenging me on being a programmer. Um, because it sucks, right? just not a cool thing to have to deal with on top of doing my job every day. And this, um, so this is twice the attrition rate for men, um, and only 20% of women um, within this group are leaving because of children or other familial problems or issues that they have to deal with. So yeah, that's a little scary, it's a little weird, right? And why do women leave, in particular? Why, why does anybody leave? Well, one big issue is harassment. Um, in the past couple weeks, um, just from the people that I know, I know three different people who have been um, horrifically attacked. Um, two sexual assaults and one um, physical, violent, physically violent attack. This is just in the people that I know, three people. At work? At conferences and at work. Because so, they were beaten by another attendee? Because by another programmer. All of them. And what was the reason for the attack? What is it? It's irrelevant. 
Well, I mean, why? If, if well, someone attacks you, it doesn't be, matter what the. But, but of course it does. Are they attacking me because I'm a programmer or a geek, or are they attacking me because they don't like me for other reasons? No, no, no like, these are specifically. This is specifically gendered and um, physically sexual violence. Oh, so that has nothing really to do with their choice of work. It's a crime of opportunity because they were together in the same place. It has nothing to do with a woman's work in IT. It has to be that they were at a conference and you've got a weirdo, right, who decides that that's okay. Um, yeah, but there's like no place that's safe. There's no place where you can go where I know there's not gonna be a weirdo that is I mean, there's no place where that's okay. No, there's no place that that's okay. That's not my question. No, but my my be, question is, how does that relate to her being an IT? Oh, and it does not okay, relate finish. to her being an IT. Oh, it totally does. Well, let me finish. Oh, okay, okay. Go ahead. Cool. Okay. All right, so um, two of them were in fact at conferences. Um, both of them um, reported this on Twitter, right? This is a place where a lot of programmers are, where a lot of our community is, and we talk a lot about you know the issues that affect us every day. And both of them, after reporting, um, they themselves were verbally attacked. They were told that they're trying to take down these other people that are more powerful, they're trying to get attention, um, that they are being um, selfish in, in saying these things publicly. Um, meanwhile, the person who attacked them, who has been identified in two cases, um, are getting back patted. I'm sorry that this is happening to you. This is really horrific and I can't imagine what you're going through. Like that, like, <laughs> It, it makes me shaky because it's so terrifying to me. There is no safe space that a lot of people can be. In two of these cases, going to the cops did nothing. The person got arrested, one immediately got released on bail, the DA decided not to prosecute, even though there was evidence. Uh, in the other, the woman was basically blackmailed into not doing anything. Right? So this is horrific stuff. You know, this is stuff that I can't tell you how many of my friends, um, regardless of gender, um, regardless of race, because it kind of crosses all of these lines, um, where we basically condone this as an industry. We tell people that like, yeah, it sucks, but like that person is an awesome programmer and like I really love his book. So if he did not, you know, say he's a bad guy, that would be cool. Um, and that's really shitty. Like what does that what does that say to every other victim or every other potential victim? This is not a safe place. For me, this is not a safe place to tell people what's happened to me because the retribution for speaking up is so much worse than that of the person who actually did the wrong. Um, so after a friend of mine um, a few months ago told me what happened to her, um, I did some research and I, I couldn't find anything about um, incidents of reporting and like what happened after you report. Because truthfully, like the incident doesn't matter. The incident itself doesn't matter. Everyone is slightly different and it's hard to kind of gauge that on any kind of scientific term. So I wanted to know what happened after you reported. You went to conference organizers, you went to your boss or that person's boss, what happened? 25 people sent me messages, and obviously this isn't super scientific research because it's all self-selection, um, but 25 people sent me messages, and 23 of them were fired following the following reporting of the three months. So it's great that we tell people, like, you can trust us, we're a family here, um, come and tell us that something is wrong, um, but we find kind of ways to, like, we're uncomfortable about the situation, it makes us uncomfortable to, to think about what has happened to you and work with you every day, um, and just kind of trying to wait for it. Um, people in marginalized groups are twice as likely to report being harassed or mistreated. Belonging <coughs> really matters to people. It really matters that you feel safe going to work every day, that you feel safe going to conferences. You know, this is, this is a place where I feel like I can go out with my friends, I can drink, and I don't have to worry about what's gonna happen. And that's not the case. And a lot of people will say, but I've never seen someone get harassed. And you know, this might be the case. And the interesting thing is, a lot of this stuff is really subtle, so sometimes it's really hard to tell when somebody's getting harassed. But the other problem is the fact that we tend to know people that are like us. And this isn't just a tech problem. This is humans in general. We tend to be with people who are in our same socioeconomic group. They're in our same racial group, in our same gender group. Um, in our industry, this is especially predominant because we have a lot of the people that kind of are in the same demographic group. So if you're a white straight guy who speaks English as a first language, you probably know almost all white straight guys who speak is there anything wrong with being a white straight guy who speaks English as a first language? No, of 
course not. But like I said, we tend to know people that are like us. So is it likely that you'll see somebody get harassed because you have no friends that are in any other group? It's difficult. So the second area is discrimination. We talk about discrimination is particularly these three different areas, pay, advancement, and job offers. Um, men are 2.7 times more likely than women to be promoted to high-ranking jobs. This is considering the fact that they're both just as likely to be promoted to kind of what we consider middle management. Right? You know, they're the you know, first level boss, second level boss. They're not C-level, they're not um, VPs of anything. And I understand there are a lot of people who work really hard to get to where they are. And I'm not discounting that at all. There are a lot of things that we do every day. We, excuse me, we you know, work on the weekends, we um, take time to learn things um, from books, we go to conferences, we, we spend our own money to do these things. We invest in our own educations. That is certainly true. But imagine dealing with all of the stuff that I talked about in the last half hour on top of having to work hard to get where you are. How much harder do you have to work to deal with harassment every day? How much harder do you have to work when you're being paid 40% less than the people that are working next to you? How much harder do you have to work when you have to keep this job because losing it might mean not having life-saving medication? So now we're kind of end, at the end of the depressing stuff. I'm sorry, I made up the vast majority of this, but I kind of want people to feel the gravity of the situation. It's very serious. It's a problem that is not getting better. And we basically, we need to put you know, a stem on what is happening here because the worse it gets, the worse it's able to get. So what can we do? First of all, the change starts with us. Like I said before, all of this stuff is cultural, it's social, it's stuff that we are able to change if we wanted to. Um, Educate people, because you have no idea how much talking to somebody else and explaining the reality of your life, the things you have to deal with every day, maybe something that a friend has gone through, statistics that you've read, can impact somebody. A lot of people have no idea how big this problem is. They have no idea how much it affects people's everyday lives. If we have no ability to empathize with other people, we, don't, we feel like, you know, this isn't really something that affects me, so like, you know, the, the women and people of color can deal with this because it's their thing. Like as privileged people, myself included, it is our job. We are the ones that are allowing the system to continue to do these kinds of things. I contribute to it all the time, and it sucks. It sucks to feel like I'm part of the problem. But there's a lot that we can do. Um, get some people. <coughs> Go to places where people like you are in the minority. This might mean you know joining a group that is completely out of your. Um, hobby range, um, going to a conference in a different country. A lot of us are very privileged to be able to do that. Talking to people that are different than us at different organizations. Um, one of the things that somebody mentioned uh, a while back was going to, um, asking to be invited to a women's group. You know, speaking to different, or just like listening to what different people are talking about, the kinds of things that affect them at work. Um, bias and discrimination are often subtle. This one is really rough. Um, no more uh, is it prevalent that, you know, we, we know that we can't like walk past somebody and slap on the ass. That is not something we're supposed to do, right? This is not an okay thing. We don't need to watch like those black and white green videos of what sexual harassment is. We know. You know, we know that we can't do those kinds of things. But a lot of the stuff that's happening anymore is subtle. It's actually interesting. When I started talking to uh, my grandmother about this, um, I found out that she was a programmer. And I had no idea. No idea. Like, I don't know. Like, when you're a kid, like, your grandma is, like, her only job is to be a grandma. And, like, in your head, she stops existing when you're not around. Because she, like, exists to be your grandma, to make cookies, to yell at you when you do stupid stuff. Um, that's all that she was to me until, you know, I, I started talking to her about this stuff. And she said, hey, I'm a programmer. I started programming in the 80s. Um, she has lived in Chicago basically forever. She worked at an insurance company um, in the 80s. And she said, you know, all of the programmers were women. This is what this wasn't unusual, which is weird for me to think. Like, if you imagine the vast majority of people at this conference were women, that feels weird, right? Because that never happens that you go to a conference where it's a majority of women. She said, you know, uh, the vast majority of us, or all of us, I'm sorry, were women, and we worked uh, in this huge building in downtown Chicago, and we all sat in the middle of the office in a steel cage, the lock from the inside. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, that's weird. Like, I, why? And she said, because um, the, the men, the salespeople, would come by and they would touch us, or they would say derogatory things to us. We couldn't get our work done. So the solution was to put us in a cage lock from the inside so we could still like let ourselves go to the bathroom, that kind of thing. They literally worked in a cage. And I was like, 
well. I'm glad that progress has been made so I don't have to be treated like a zoo animal anymore. That's great. Um, but this kind of stuff is still happening. People are still leaving the field. Um, like, so just dealing with that subtle stuff is hard. There's something called uh, microaggressions, which is basically like, um, subtle things that we do in our language that kind of signal to somebody that like, you don't belong here, or you're different than me. Um, being in a meeting and, you know, um, always insisting that the woman is the one that takes the notes. Like, the woman is always the first one to notice this. Like, why is nobody else taking the notes? Like, and I mean, like I said, a lot of this stuff is subtle. You don't realize you have these biases. So, learning to apologize. This one is hard and it sucks. It really hurts uh, you when you realize you hurt somebody else. Um, none of us want to think that we have done something to offend somebody or um, removed opportunities from them. Um, but learning to apologize is an awesome part of being an adult and a part of growing. Um, my friend Prana has this really awesome analogy of like, we, when we're kids, we go through training. We don't even realize. Somebody comes to our school and tells us, okay, if you're ever on fire, what do you do? Right, how many times do they tell you that? A million, right? And then they, like, we practiced it. Like, we practiced it just in case it happened, right? Um, the likelihood as a child that you will ever be caught on fire is extremely low. Extremely low, right? Like, you are not near grills. You are, like, not jumping over bonfires because adults are dumb. Let's, like, seriously, let's put it out there. Um, they're not, you know, near open flames a lot. But they drill this into us when we're kids because they know that when we're adults, when you're on fire, you are on fire, right? You panic, like you freak out, you run around, and you still see people like do that all the time, like in movies, they're like, how do I'm on fire, right? They don't stop, drop, and roll like you know that we're supposed to do more kids. So apologizing the same way. We should drill what this is into us, and it doesn't become such a big deal than when we are on fire. So um, apologizing has uh, three easy rules, just like making ice, which is, um, you know, get an ice cream tray, put water in it, stick it in the freezer, very easy. So apologizing, what I did was wrong. I'm sorry, that's the most important part. If you say the word but, stop and start over because that's not an apology. And then try to make it up to them by not doing it again. Like that's like minimum, minimum decent human being stuff right there, right? We should also be talking about these issues openly. Um, I don't think enough people realize that talking about these things in public in a place where other people can see means that people that are on the sidelines that don't know how to feel about these things this is an education for them. They can see like, I've never been in that situation before, but now, now that I've seen this, like now I know, you know, now I know stop, drop, and roll. Um, also, that's not cool is probably the best weapon in your arsenal as a person who might be a bystander. You see a friend get harassed, the easiest way to, you know, not cause a fist fight is just to be like, hey, that's not cool. What you just did is not okay. I use this on Twitter all the time, actually. Like the frowny face really helps. Um, <laughs> I should actually make like a macro for this for my computer so I can just like TNC send. Um, but also remember that just because someone is a brilliant programmer doesn't mean that they're infallible. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't be called out for stuff. Um, they should not be getting away with this any more than the average person. Because think about the reach that a brilliant programmer has compared to Joe Shimo who's walking around the community. They're a role model. Uh, have hard conversations with people. It takes a lot of education for people to start coming around to this stuff. Uh, and very few people, if they don't think this affects them, will actually seek it out themselves. Uh, influence change in our communities and workplaces. Talk to your boss about the different things you can be doing. Um, talk to conferences about why they don't have a code of conduct. Ask them how you can help increase diversity. Uh, increase education and access. Um, how many people are parents in here? Cool. Did you know that your child is like 50% more likely to go into a STEM field because you're in one? All you have to do is be there, like show up. That's pretty cool. Like you automatically have an advantage over tons of other parents. Um, help facilitate events for marginalized people in tech. There are awesome groups like Black Girls Code, uh, Latino Startups, Black Entrepreneurs, Girls Develop It, um, Rails Bridge, High Ladies. Um, they exist in every community. They're all over the place. Uh, if you can't give them time, give them money. If you can't give them money, give them a place to hold the meetings. Donate your computers to them. Those old computers that you have sitting in your closet and all those old peripherals that you never use. Volunteer at local schools and groups and not in the rich neighborhoods, please. They do not need that. They already have computers. They have computers at home as well. Um, you can 
um, offer to be a Big Brother Week sister. You can help out with the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Um, go to go to um, middle schools and say like, hey, I would love to teach um, a class about what programming is. Come at financial resources. Um, if you are donating money to your university that makes lots and lots of money that you already gave lots and lots of money, you can consider like splitting that donation in half and giving it to a technical college or a women's college or a um, historical black college. There are a lot of other places that could use those resources a lot more than your Ivy League school can. Where Chicago has one of the only HBCUs in the world. There you go. There you go. Beth knows. Tell her, and she'll put you up with them. I don't know very much about them. Did I say that again? I am HBC. Historically black. Historical black. Yeah. Oh. It's like one of the only ones in the world. Um, uh, ask. Ask. Um, work with colleges and universities and ask them what they're doing um, to increase um, exposure to people who have less access to technology. Um, we can remove bias from our educational institutions in really creative ways. Like there's an awesome school called Harvey Mudd, and um, a woman president came in and her niece said, like, hey, I'm in this computer program class and I'm the only woman in there, and it's really weird and I don't know why. And so she took a look at Harvey Mudd's roles and basically said, like, the number of women that are coming into this program that don't graduate from it or drop out is extremely high. Why is that? So they did some experiment, experiments, and they found that the thing that works best for them is to ask people coming in, have you programmed before? That was it. Have you programmed before? Okay, you're in that class over there. Putting people in a class with their peers where so they feel like, oh, he knows way more than me. Am I dumb? Like, am I supposed to know this already? Uh, I'm already so far behind, why should I even be doing this? It's huge. Enable people to feel like they're able, they're, they're able to learn this, they're able to catch up. Can we change our workplaces? Think about what the about page of your website, your company website looks like right now. Is it all white people? Is it all dudes? Is it all white dudes? Like, there is a lot that's wrong with that, right? And there's something that signals people when they're going to apply for your company. This is the first thing I do is look at an about page for a company. There's something that signals to people like, oh, you're all white dudes? Like, do you have diverse people and they left? Why? Like, that's a kind of a scary thing. I don't want to be the first, you know? I don't want to go into a situation that's maybe not that great. Um, oh, there's an awesome Tumblr called 100% Men if you've never seen a, a, uh, a company website that has all white dudes on their page. Like, yeah. So we can change our culture. Remember that it's a lot harder to retain great people than it is to recruit them. Think of the culture of your company like a garden. You want to value variety and prune any weeds out. These might be the best programmers you have. They might be the first ones that have to go. Um, we can change our job listing language and requirements. Um, there's another awesome Tumblr called Tech Companies Who Only Hire Men, which um, all of the job ads use he, um, guy, man, dude, as all of the words in, in their job listings. And like, you don't think it makes a big deal, but it signals to somebody like, I don't want to really fit in here. They're not thinking about women, so they must not have any. Um, don't require open source contributions. As I said before, um, women make up only 3% of open source contributors. If on top of it, you're requiring a CS degree, um, like I said before, women in the United States, 17% of all CS grads are women. So if you're requiring those two things, that person doesn't exist. That is the unicorn right there. And a bunch of people pretend to require CS degrees. I get all these job offers that are like, you must be, and I mean all of them, but I don't have CS degree. And I'm always like, oh, sorry, I don't have CS degree. They're like, oh, well, you don't really have like, Exactly. Like, like, take it off. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. Well, they all said that you need to have two years of experience with people like, and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then what do they tell you? Like, don't work for that company because they're dumb. They don't know. Right, really quick, because we're out of time. Make sure that your benefits are adequate for all people. Do you have same-sex partner benefits? Do you have trans inclusive health care? Um, what are your parental leave policies? Do you offer things like flex time for people who have to deal with dependent care or um, medical appointments? Do you actually know what these policies are? I can't tell you how many companies I've talked to. I'm like, out of curiosity, what is your parental leave? Like, I'm not planning to have children, but like, I, I just want to know. And they're like, oh, I have to get back to you on that. I'm like, you don't know that? Like, you're the HR person, you don't know? Like, does that mean no one has ever taken parental leave? That's kind of weird. So ask, make, find out what those things are. Make sure that everybody has equal pay. This is something that should like be something we automatically do, but we don't. Like I said, Latino women make 59% of what white men do. This happens for a reason. The, over the course of time, people make less and less. 
So do a payroll audit, create a table, and make sure that people's skills are, are mapping to what they're getting paid. We can do things like mentoring and career goal attainment, um, ask people what they want to do for a career. Yes? What do you do about equal pay as an employee? Yeah, how do you do that last thing? Is that in your book? Rachel. <laughs> it, it is in my book. Um, yeah, so um, you basically go to the company and say either make this transparent or what I want you to do is to group all employees by their job title and by whatever other vector. So their race, their gender, and is like are women developers getting paid way less than male developers? Like you don't have to tell me what everybody's making, but like that those numbers right there should tell me something. Um, and really quick, this requires participation from everyone. Like I said before, this does affect all of us, even though we didn't necessarily realize that before. And it's really important that all of us work towards this because marginalized people can't do it alone. We owe it to people who we are basically benefiting um, from their lack of success, okay? So what can we accomplish together at doing this? It's not gonna be solved overnight, it's really hard. There's not just one solution, there are a thousand different solutions because there are a thousand different problems. Um, 